So welcome, I'm Jennifer Brown, the Assistant Director for Cancer Prevention and Control Programs in the Center for Equity and Community Wellness at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And I welcome you to the Colorectal Cancer Screening in the Post-Pandemic Era webinar, brought to you by New York Citywide Colorectal Cancer Control Coalition and Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Next slide. This activity has been planned and implemented in accordance with accreditation requirements and policies of ACCME and as a joint providership of the Mount Sinai Icon School of Medicine and the New York Citywide Colorectal Cancer Control Coalition, or C5. The Icon School of Medicine and Mount Sinai designates this for one credit. Next slide. These are our disclosures. Dr. Melissa Latore is consultant advisor to MODIS GI, and Dr. Matt Weissman, myself, and Dr. Pascal White have no financial relationships to disclose, and no commercial support has been provided for this activity. Next slide. At the end, you'll see this slide again with the link, and this is where you go for the course evaluation to get the CME certificate. Next slide. So our agenda today is first we have Dr. Pascal White, colorectal cancer screening in New York City, the impact of COVID-19. Then Dr. Melissa Latore, pre-procedure counseling for colorectal cancer screening. And Dr. Matt Weissman, colorectal cancer screening in the post-pandemic era, a primary care perspective. And then we'll have a panel discussion with a Q&A with all three faculty. So as we go through, please enter your questions in the chat box, and you can also introduce yourself in the chat box. Next slide. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Pascal White, Assistant Professor of Medicine and Director of the Gastroenterology Clinic in the Henry Janowitz Division of Gastroenterology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Hoyt. Thank you so much, Jennifer and to C5 for inviting me to do this webinar this evening. Next slide, please. So the objectives this evening uh, are to highlight the New York City screening guidelines and the updated uh, USPSTF guidelines for colorectal cancer screening. We're going to describe New York City screening rates pre-COVID to get a sense of how we're doing before the pandemic and to identify the barriers of colorectal cancer screening during the pandemic. Next slide, please. So in 2020, uh, C5 updated recommendations for colorectal cancer screening, uh, which took into account the rising incidence of early onset colorectal cancer. And so the guidelines were to consider screening at age 45 for average risk individuals. Options included uh, a colonoscopy every 10 years, a stool-based uh, screening with either an annual FIT or FOBT, uh, or a multi-target stool DNA test every three years. Now, patients at high risk for colorectal cancer due to either having a family history of colorectal cancer or other conditions that increase their risk may need to have been screened before age 45. Next slide, please. Now, this was uh, hot off the press this year and made a big splash when uh, the United States Preventive Services Task Force updated their guidelines as well and kind of fell in line with um, recommending screening to begin at age 45. Now, this was a grade B recommendation, which means that they found moderate evidence to support the recommendations and the harms were small. All of that to say is that once they change these guidelines, most uh, insurance companies do uh, follow suit with the USPSTF guidelines of at least a grade A or B recommendation. So there may be changes on the horizon with respect to how uh, colonoscopies are going to be covered now with the younger age. Next slide, please. Now, 
So this is pre-COVID data where New York City was tracking the prevalence of timely colonoscopy in the past 10 years among adults 50 years of age and older by race. And the figure shows the overall New York City screening rate was at 42% in 2003, but by 2018, the overall screening rate had increased to 69%. Now this increase is uh, for timely colonoscopy, and this was seen across the board for all races where all racial and ethnic groups had similar colonoscopy rate. So the 72% among black adults, 69% among white and Latino adults, and 65% among Asian Pacific Islander adults. Next slide, please. Now, among Latinos, the prevalence of timely colonoscopy and stool-based testing in 2008 were as follows. So this bar graph showing uh, this prevalence specifically among Latino men and women who were 50 years of age or older in New York City at the time. And it shows here that women had more timely colonoscopy versus men, so 73 versus 64%. Yet men had more timely stool-based testing, interestingly, compared to women, 24% uh, versus 12%. Next slide, please. So if we wanted to look at the overall trend of colorectal cancer screening in New York City before the pandemic, we can see that there was a steady rise in colorectal cancer screening in New York City. And since about 2011, 2012, the rate has been stable at about 70% uh, among adults who are 50 years and older. Next slide. With respect to race, uh, there has been more variability uh, when you were looking at uh, this graph for Asian Pacific Islander population in New York City. And whereas the gap seemed to have been closed in some years, here we can see in 2010, um, for instance, the gap has since widened a bit, uh, where we see there was uh, screening among this group had declined. So uh, this graph honestly is a reminder uh, to me and should be reminded to everyone that colorectal cancer screening is definitely a dynamic, uh, involved and active process. This is something that we would need to continue to promote among our patients uh, and not take for granted that we, we close the gap. We should continue to have that as a, a particular uh, goal of ours here in the city. Next slide, please. So this is a report from the Department of Health on trends in colorectal cancer screening mortality and by race and ethnicity in New York City in 2003 and 2017. And as we can see, pre-pandemic, the deaths from colorectal cancer was declining among all race ethnicities here in the city. So Blacks went from 22 to 13.8 for 100,000 residents, Whites 20.7 to 12.6, and Latinos from 14.3 to 10.3, and Asian Pacific Islanders from 10 to about 8.9. However, just to make note that white, black and white New Yorkers still have the highest age adjusted rate of death from colorectal cancer. Next slide. Now, what impact would we expect to see during a global pandemic that nobody expected and, and where endoscopy suites were, were shut down, hospitals in New York City were inundated with taking care of COVID patients? So although we won't see the majority of the data and the entirety of the impact on New York City for years to come, some data has emerged with respect to the screening rates in the US at large. And it was reported that in the US between January 20, uh, 2020 and April 21st, 2020, uh, colorectal cancer screening rates were estimated to have dropped by 85%. And so by June 16, 2020, colorectal cancer screening rates remained 36% below pre-COVID-19 levels. That equated to about 95,000 missed colorectal cancer screenings. That's 64% less than expected historical data, which is astounding. Next slide, please. Now, this was a model uh, showing the impact of the pandemic with respect to mortality and what they estimated to be uh, the excess deaths from colorectal cancer and breast cancer. And uh, we see colorectal cancer here uh, represented in the dark blue bars and uh, breast cancer depicted here in the light blue bars. And what they said was that the modeling predicted an excess of 10,000 deaths from colorectal cancer and breast cancer over the next decade. And this is presumably from lower screenings and later stages of diseases diagnosed. Next slide, please. 
Prior to COVID, uh, barriers existed for colorectal cancer screening. That's that's obvious. But the pandemic exacerbated these barriers on many different levels. So we have healthcare factors on the left, uh, which we see that they were limited elective procedures and a growing backlog of uh, patients awaiting screening. And the solutions here after the arrows were to implement uh, increased stool-based testing and prioritizing screening based on individual risk profile. Now on the right, we have patient factors, uh, which included uh, fear and psycho psychological stress, basically. So the fear barrier was always there, but this time it's now compounded with the fear of exposure to the virus uh, during in-person screening, which undoubtedly influenced uh, seeking preventive cancer care. Now, the lack of insurance and money was also a known barrier, but this time we were seeing a growing, uh, you know, an unprecedented rate of unemployment, loss of insurance among those who had already um, had insurance or those who are basically already struggling to get preventive care. And those with already strained resources to provide for their basic needs were even more likely to seek preventive service. Now, worsened disparities due to decreased awareness, uh, the places where patients could have gotten their information, for example, community centers or other trusted community spaces, uh, they were closed, uh, which can lead to a loss of a vital resource where people obtain health information uh, and other resources. And so there was a, a limited knowledge um, of, of you know, where patients can get their care, you know, whether it's telemedicine, especially among minority patients and the elderly. And so potential solutions had included incorporating obviously telemedicine, stool-based testing, measuring patients on the use of, you know, reassuring them uh, rather on the use of PPE and pre-procedure testings, uh, allocating resources for screening programs and extending awareness via virtual platforms. All of this was a Herculean effort to try to make sure that uh, patients who needed to get screened were, all, were aware that uh, us doctors were also trying to get them in uh, even during a global pandemic. Next slide, please. So this was a brilliant paper uh, written by Dr. Sophie Balzora, Rachel Isaka, Ajwa Anyeni Yaboa, Dr. Daryl Gray, and Dr. Folame uh, that brought awareness to the impact of COVID-19 on existing colorectal cancer screening disparities among the medically underserved, um, as well as potential solutions for implementation among this vulnerable group. And so focusing on the screening specifically in the box, uh, the authors encouraged the use of non-invasive screening modalities, um, increasing the use of male fit outreach programs, which we want to encourage all of us to think about within practices, um, establishing calls for the pickup and return of fit kits. So it's one thing to mail them out, uh, but it's a different uh, situation where you're trying to establish a workplace workflow uh, to ensure that the kits are returned in a timely manner. And thus, COVID-19 gave us a lot to think about with respect to how we're doing with colorectal cancer screening in New York City, what those barriers are, and how we can get back on track with screening our patients, whether it's engaging the community uh, via existing platforms to extend colorectal cancer screening awareness year-round, or leveraging our most accessible technology to sustain communication with our patients, uh, or using whatever platforms we have in our toolbox in order to promote events or even the new screening guidelines whenever possible. Next slide. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Melissa Latore. Please uh, advance the slide. Dr. Melissa Latore is the Director of Inpatient GI Services at Tisch Kimmel NYU Langone Health, and she will be talking to us next about pre-procedure counseling for colon cancer screening. I'd like to thank the C5 for inviting me to speak today and also my colleagues at Mount Sinai. The objectives of my talk are to discuss how to triage symptoms and family history prior to discussion on screening, to list the steps to obtaining a colonoscopy, to discuss pre-procedure clearance and considerations for the primary care doctor, and to provide preliminary answers to patient questions and concerns. So first, symptom triage. So 
when is it necessary to ask for an expedited evaluation? And these are what we call alarm signs in gastroenterology. And this is when it would be a good idea to communicate directly with a gastroenterologist and say, hey, I have a patient that has these alarm signs and I'd like for them to be seen sooner than whatever is next available. So that's a change in bowel habits and that often can present as new constipation, also blood and stool, iron deficiency anemia, weight loss, change in the stool caliber, and a palpable rectal or abdominal mass. Another thing to consider when assessing a patient is their family history. And a lot of these screening and surveillance tests distinguish between the average risk patient and the high risk patient. So in order to ask for a high risk family history, you wanna identify whether there is at least one first degree relative, whether a parent, brother, sister, or child with colorectal cancer or an advanced adenomatous or serrated polyp. And that actually changes the start to uh, a patient's uh, screening and surveillance. So that would be if the first degree relative is less than 60 years of age, or if the first degree relative is greater than 60 years of age is where we uh, draw the line. And regardless, both of them start at, a, at a 40 or 10 years younger than the earliest family member, whichever is the younger age of the two. Um, if the first degree relative was under 60, then the screening will be repeated at most every five years. Um, and if the first degree relative is over 60 years, then the screening is on the same schedule as an average risk person. The key thing here to just take home is that if there is a first degree relative, at least one, then screening starts much earlier. So you've identified a patient with alarm signs or a uh, high risk family history, you, or you've asked these questions to ascertain that information. If they do um, check positive for either of these, then a colonoscopy is indicated because the colonoscopy is the best exam and the only one indicated for patients who are high risk or have these alarm signs. Now, if they're not high risk and don't have any alarm signs and they're there for just a standard age appropriate screening, then a colonoscopy or a non invasive test would then be appropriate. The important thing and, and the message that we want to get out there is that the best test is the one that actually gets done. So the next I'll discuss some pre-procedure counseling. So the patient might ask, will I be asleep? You can respond, maybe, but you will feel comfortable. So to discuss sedation expectations, there are different types of, of sedations that can be given for colonoscopy. Rarely, but sometimes in certain scenarios, the patient can be done without any sedation or awake. That's often what happens in very rural areas where the patient thereafter has to drive themselves home several hours. But it's, it's an unlikely scenario in our New York City environment. The two more common examples are moderate conscious sedation, which is admitted, administered by the gastroenterologist themselves. The patient will be drowsy, but will have purposeful reactions to verbal and tactile stimuli, and there'll be no airway intervention, meaning the patient will continue to breathe on their own. Deeper sedation or general anesthesia is administered by an anesthesiologist, and there the, there will be decreased response to stimuli or the patient will be unarousable. This may or may not require intubation or ventilation support depending on, uh, on the needs of that individual patient as decided by the anesthesiologist. So in short, either the sedation will be none, um, less likely, but um, and then either by a gastroenterologist or by an anesthesiologist. But the take home point is that the patient will be comfortable. Where will the procedure be performed? So the answer here is at the location that is safest for you, possibly at a surgical center or possibly at a hospital. And how do we, how do we determine that? Well, we use the anesthesia classification for risk here, the ASA classification, to determine what is the most appropriate location for a patient to receive their colonoscopy. So often ASA 1 or 2, so that's a normal healthy patient or a patient with mild systemic disease that's controlled, like controlled hypertension, can be safely done at an ambulatory surgical center. Patients with more severe medical history and systemic disease, such as cardiovascular disease or diabetes with complications, congestive heart failure, 
would more likely be done at a hospital setting. So other considerations is if there's some kind of respiratory issue from obesity or sleep apnea, COPD, or if the patient has cardiac devices such as a, a pacemaker or an LVAD. Um, these types of patients would be done in a hospital setting where there are more resources in case there's any kind of emergency. So, what do I do with my medications? So, as the primary care doctor, you'll say, I will give you instructions before your procedure. So, some suggestions here um, with the medications is to remember that prior to a colonoscopy, the patient will be experiencing profound diarrhea. So to make sure that there's caution with antihypertensives, perhaps even um, diuretics uh, in this scenario. Also, the other medications where we wanna be cautious is with glycemic medications, especially insulin, since the patient will be nothing per oral or NPO prior to their procedure. Another area of concern is blood thinners with respect to polypectomy. So again, the purpose of a colonoscopy and screening is to go in there, look for and remove precancerous lesions. So in, in terms of polypectomy, aspirin is usually acceptable for biopsy and polypectomy. So very so really in, in as per the guidelines of, of gastroenterology, um, it's okay to leave this on board. Doesn't need to be stopped if it's actually necessary. For uh, Colonoscopy can be performed with two concepts, a diagnostic test and a therapeutic test. So think of therapeutic as in, if you see a polyp, you want to remove it. Um, so in that case, if you're just going in to look and see, oh, does the patient have colon cancer or not, then the, the procedure can be performed on anticoagulation or antiplatelets. And sometimes we have this discussion with the patient saying, you know, if we can't stop your anticoagulation, um, we may see things, but we won't remove them. But again, this is a discussion and, and some pre-procedure counseling that, that will be done for the patient in conjunction with the gastroenterologist. But if, a, if an antiplatelet or an anticoagulant can be suspended or bridged, that's something that should be documented in preparation for the procedure. So depending on the patient's medical history and risk of thrombosis or compli complication. So again, these are things to be considered um, in pre-procedure counseling. Then as a primary care doctor, it's important to discuss the timing of this continuation. And this is often based on the patient's specific medications and the pharmacokinetics of the actual medication. So some of them being renally cleared, may be dependent on the renal function and may require up to four days to be fully out of the patient system or even seven, depending on the actual medication, whether it's an anticoagulant one of the newer DOAX or an antiplatelet. Now, moving on to medical clearance. Um, in the grand scheme of things, endoscopy and colonoscopy is considered a low risk procedure. And I mean low risk procedure in comparison to some of the other medical clearances that are done for open heart surgery or intracranial surgery. Those are really considered more high risk. So on, the, on that spectrum, it's really considered low risk, but not no risk. So um, there is still uh, a clearance that should be performed and individualized to the patient's uh, personal medical history. And medical clearance should be escalated to a cardiologist in the setting of significant cardiovascular disease, and especially in the setting of recent cardiovascular stents. Again, medication discontinuation and reinitiation should also be addressed and discussed and also documented so it's clearly communicated uh, between physicians. So what do I have to do to prepare? The gastroenterologist will guide you through this, but it usually consists of a special diet and a laxative preparation to clean your colon. And I often tell patients that the colonoscopy prep is the worst part of the experience. The laxative preparation is intended to facilitate visualization of colonic mucosa. And while it is the most, uh, the worst part of the procedure. It's also the most important because how well the colon is cleared really impacts the safety, accuracy, quality, difficulty, and speed of the procedure. So with that said, there are, there are several types of preps out there, but the, the general concept is there um, are preps that are in low volume, about two liters, and that are standard volume 
about four liters. And depending on the formulation, they may be isoosmotic, hypoosmotic, or hyperosmotic formulations. And again, the, the decision of the PrEP um, is often made by the gastroenterologist and, and kind of in conjunction with um, the, uh, the patient's medical history and also, you know, what in insurances might cover for that individual patient. So one other thing or one important thing to know is that splitting the dose of the preparation, giving half um, at one point and another half closer to the time of the procedure actually improves patient tolerance and clearance of the stool. And that second half of the split dose really helps to clear that right side of the colon where there's a, often missed lesions and, and um, missed polyps, flat polyps, things that are more difficult to see. The second portion is often timed to optimize the clearance and, and in, in conjunction or, or timed with the time of the patient's colonoscopy. This is a really important point that I always get from patients. They're like, doc, I haven't eaten in like three days. There's nothing in me. But even if the patient hasn't eaten, they will still make stool. So dietary modifications will be implemented. So usually that's a clear liquid diet um, or a low residue diet in the days before as directed by the gastroenterologist. So what are some of the risk factors for a poor preparation? So these are things we know, but constipation is the number one risk factor for a poor preparation, because if there's already an abundance of stool in there, it's gonna be harder to clear out. So if, if there's anything that you can help us with, it's identifying constipation early and starting the patient on laxatives, even in advance of their initial consultation with the gastroenterologist. A poor history, uh, a prior history of poor preparation, male gender, medications such as diuretics or opioids, immobility, uh, dementia and Parkinson's disease, obesity and diabetes. Now, what should I do about COVID-19? Should I wait? And the answer here is definitely no, especially as Dr. White slides indicated. And currently, right now, there is pre-procedure screening and testing and physician and staff vaccination and patient vaccination and personal protective equipment. And between all of those combined, we would like to think that colonoscopy is very safe and the last few months have really proved that to us. So, what happens? The patient got their colonoscopy, and now what? And the important thing to remember here is that it's not just about getting one colonoscopy. It's about setting up a lifetime practice where the patient will continue to come back at the intervals that are recommended by their procedure. So they have their initial colonoscopy, and every, the prep is excellent. Um, the exam is complete. So this here is the baseline colonoscopy findings. And then depending on what's seen, whether it's one to two polyps, the number of polyps, the size of the polyps, the recommended interval for surveillance will, will be listed often in a report. And it's important, you know, as years pass that the patient be reminded, oh, you know, your colonoscopy is coming up next year. Your report said three years or your report said seven years. But this is really um, after the initial colonoscopy. We want to make sure that patients continue to be engaged in screening and surveillance. So the take home points are the primary care physician plays a critical role in patient triage, medical clearance and continued screening and surveillance. There are different testing options and the best test is really the one that gets done. Uh, finally, colon cancer screening is safe and more necessary than ever considering the recent pandemic. So thank you. And uh, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Matthew Weissman, the chair of the Department of Medicine and primary care physician at Mount Sinai, Beth Israel and downtown. Excellent, thanks so much, Dr. Latore. So on the next slide, um, I just wanted to talk about our objectives today to highlight the New York City colorectal screening guidelines that you've heard about already, and to identify some of the barriers for colorectal screening during and after the pandemic and some 
pitfalls and challenges um, and find some ways to try to address them, including through the use of telehealth. Next slide, please. So, um, so this was a survey that just got released by the American Cancer Society that I thought was really interesting that looked at overall the top barriers to cancer screening in the pandemic era. Um, and a lot of them are the same things that, you know, there were issues before people not understanding screening because they don't have any symptoms, people feeling like they didn't get a recommendation from their doctor, procrastinating it, um, certainly issues about costs and insurance, as Dr. White mentioned earlier, and then, um, and then the issues about COVID-19. And there's a companion document that goes with this, if you're interested, we'll send you the link uh, down below on the slides that actually talks about specific messaging to try to, to bring this message home um, to different groups of people. On the next slide, I just wanted to highlight one thing that the Department of Health has done on the next slide. Um, C5 and the, and the New York City Department of Health have done an amazing job of putting out some really relevant educational materials because a lot of those barriers are really things that can be solved through education around um, you know, the systems that are in place and what patients really need to know. So these are two of the more recent educational pieces. These are kind of mini novellas written at a really approachable um, literacy level um, with really kind of compelling stories about choosing colon cancer screening tests and, uh, and how to prepare for colonoscopy. So it goes through in stages how to do all of those things, and those are uh, available to you through the city. And they really sort of demystify a lot of these processes that we're talking about tonight. So we do get questions on the next slide. We do get questions about um, patients with uh, no insurance, which, you know, happens a lot less often thanks to the Affordable Care Act, which covers all of the screening tests that are USPS, TF, A, and B. So that includes the recent guideline that Dr. White mentioned uh, of starting at 45 and of uh, including stool testing. So fewer and fewer people should really be without insurance. But for New Yorkers without insurance over 50 since 2013, the city has really facilitated uh, colonoscopies at uh, these ambulatory endoscopy centers, and they've screened almost 6,000 individuals in those years, um, including you know, removing hundreds or thousands of adenomas and di diagnosing 19 cancers. So a really great program that if you're not involved in is a good way to get people uh, direct colonoscopies. And I didn't include on the slide also, the state has a cancer services program where some people are eligible for colorectal cancer screening as well as pap testing and mammograms. Next slide, please. So as we saw on the, on the survey form from ACS, about 14% of people highlighted COVID as a concern in terms of going out and getting screening. And as, as Dr. White mentioned, somewhere in the neighborhood of 85% of uh, 85% decrease in colorectal screening during, during this era. So it really is incumbent on all of us to do some coordinated outreach and really start calling patients and getting them connected to care, whether that's colonoscopies or stool-based testing. A good way to do that triage piece may be through video visits. And certainly in our practices in Union Square, we've seen a huge uptick in, in video visits that's persisted even as the pandemic has eased. And so it's a great way to talk through screening options with patients who are scared to leave their homes or don't wanna leave their homes and help triage people to uh, stool-based testing versus colonoscopies and direct colonoscopy referrals versus seeing the GI doctor first, which in many cases that can happen by video visit as well. I was hoping going into the pandemic that video visits would actually reduce uh, disparities that would create easier ways for people to access care without having to leave their homes or their jobs. And I think that what, what we're seeing now is that 
it's actually the opposite, that video visits might be um, exacerbating some of the disparities that were already in place and that people who are having trouble coming in person are having even greater trouble navigating video visits. So there's a lot more work that we and others are doing on that. But it is something important to consider as we think about video visits uh, for colorectal screening in the post-COVID era. Direct colonoscopy, as we mentioned, is a good opportunity. And stool-based testing by mail, whether that's um, sending out fit kits, as we talked about a little bit today, or engaging um, exact sciences and fit DNA testing through Coligard, which also gets sent uh, directly to patients through the mail without their really having to leave their home. Next slide, please. And it is important to offer those patients a choice. You know, I'm still quoting this article from 2012 that looked at uh, offering patients stool-based testing or colonoscopy or the choice. And as you can see in patients offered the choice of both tests, it actually increased the overall screening rate without cannibalizing the colonoscopies at all. And so it is really a sort of marching orders to make sure that we're offering choices to all of our patients. Next slide, please. So these are, as Dr. White mentioned, the new New York City guidelines that came out in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so got a little overshadowed by what else was in the news, but important to highlight. And, and you know, this is a big piece of why we're having this webinar is to make sure we spread the word for average risk sc screening starting at 45. And that colonoscopy and stool-based testing are on a level playing field in these guidelines. And so we really do want people to offer any of those tests, colonoscopy, FIT testing, FIT DNA, or high sensitivity FOBT um, at the appropriate intervals to their patients at average risk. Next slide. Despite the fact that I've been talking about stool-based testing for years, and I thought we had resolved this question, um, I did get a, some patient asked me a couple of weeks ago whether it's even legal for them to send stool through the mail. Um, so I'd actually Googled that a few years ago for this talk, and it it turns out that the um, intent matters. So perfectly legal to send stool through the mail for stool-based testing. Um, this woman who cited here sent stool to her neighbor um, because she in retribution for uh, her next door neighbor's dog barking too loudly or something that it turns out is not legal. Although when I when I Googled this again last week, I was intrigued to find what's on the next slide, which didn't exist six years ago when I Googled this last. So the next slide, this is an actual service called poop senders, always fresh, always anonymous, where you can actually send I guess it's elephant stool uh, to people you don't like. Next slide, please. So these are some of the common, common challenges that I hear about from patients. And as we open up the uh, floor for questions in a minute, and I'm also interested to hear what, um, you know, what have worked for, for others in the community. So a common thing I hear is that people live in buildings where they can't reliably get packages delivered or that their packages get stolen. Um, and so this is an opportunity for people to either come and pick their fit tests up in person or to have things sent to, um, to a neighbor or a relative or somewhere where they can get packages or to have them sent for, to us. So when we get fit DNA testing through Cologuard, they will send the kit wherever you want, and certainly they could send them to us and the patients could come and pick them up here um, if that's a safer way to do it. We have um, patients with limited cell phone minutes, and so they're tired of getting all the navigator calls either about their prep or why they haven't returned their stool-based testing or whatever. And so we're trying to be flexible about using um, texting or uh, patient portals or other ways to reach um, to reach patients and remembering that, you know, what works for one person doesn't work for everybody. We may need to try different systems uh, to really get to different patients and to get them to collect their stool based testing and, and bring it back. And that's in, in, you know, particularly important when we're working with folks who are 
of limited English proficiency or limited health literacy, remembering that only about 11% of Americans have high health literacy. And so really important as the Department of Health has done to put their uh, materials at a relatively low reading level and using very different um, you know, visual and auditory and, and printed cues. When we give out fit kits or order Cologuard, um, we have our nurses come in and actually have a sample kit and demonstrate how to do the testing um, to try to get as, get through as many barriers as we can. There's also, uh, Cologuard has a helpline or an online chat where people can contact even without using up minutes. And there's lots of YouTube videos out there for all the different fit kits and fit DNA out there. So people can, um, people can watch online and try to, try to mimic that. I've also had a lot of patients, um, who are just don't want to handle their stool and just think it's gross in general. Um, we try to talk about whether that's grosser or less gross than having a colonoscopy. Um, but we also have a lot of patients who collect their stool and whatever thing they think is sanitary, um, which may be one of our urine cups or some other, some other container, and then bring it in so that our team can actually turn it into a fit test or a high sensitivity FOBT or a Cologuard. Um, so that they don't have to go through the actually sticking the sticks into the stool. Uh, next slide. So I think that's what I wanted to cover. I think you've heard today um, about the new guidelines, the both the USPSTF and the New York City guidelines, the importance of offering multiple tests and meeting the patients where they're at, and particularly, you know, in either in preparation for colonoscopy, making sure that their questions are answered um, and, and that their prep and dietary procedures are as, as optimized as they can be. And then also making sure that we're offering stool-based testing and, um, and um, giving people the choice to really pick which um, which stool-based test or which, which colorectal screening tests um, people want, remembering that we were plateauing even before the pandemic. And so it's really on all of us to try to figure out how to get over that screening plateau um, and really increase our colorectal screening rates for everyone. So with that, um, we wanted to make sure we left a lot of time for questions. So we have about 15 minutes if people wanna start entering their questions in the chat, I know there are a couple of questions there already. Maybe I'll start it off by just asking my gastroenterology colleagues about sort of auditing um, colonoscopy reports. Like, what should I be looking at in terms of completion, withdrawal time, prep quality, uh, adenoma detection rates? Like, how, how do I know if this was a good colonoscopy? I'll take that question. Um, so the first important part is, was it a full exam? So somewhere on the report, it'll usually tell you whether it went from anus to cecum or to ileum, which is a little bit beyond the colon. But it's important to know whether it was a complete exam because it, we have to see the entire colon to really give somebody um, a clean bill of health. The next part, which is a little bit more ambiguous, um, is the language regard, regarding how clean the colon was. So, you know, at this point, we really like to see um, a good prep or an excellent prep, or even um, if the physician went so far as to report a Boston bowel prep score, so a um, BBPS. So those are the um, the verbiage that you want to see in the report and, and audit. And you can go online and just Google BBPS to get a sense of the Boston Bowel Prep Score to get a sense of what we're looking for in terms of cleanliness. But basically, it's important to be able to suction away all the liquid and to see the, the mucosa well. Um, and so words such as fair or adequate or, uh, or inadequate or like everything you can but this one section of the colon of the colon was not clean are, are often bring to to question you know whether this test should be repeated or not and if a, a colonoscopy prep is not adequate the goal is to have it repeated within a year um, so 
with that said, those are the two main things to look for. And then the other thing to, to audit is, is there another, um, is there somewhere listed there a, a um, withdrawal time? Now, if the, the withdrawal time really only makes a difference if the complaint, if the exam is considered to be completely normal. So, um, if the exam is negative and there are no polyps, you want to see that the physician <laughs> took about six minutes or more to examine the mucosa, meaning that they didn't just pull the camera out when they were looking. So, those are really the most important things to audit on a colonoscopy report. Um, and then there should be, if there were polyps um, found, there should be some verbiage as to when the next colonoscopy should be done. Um, other things that it's possible to ask, which may or may not be uh, information you'll be able to obtain, but you can instruct your patient um, to ask the physician about their adenoma detection rate. So how often are they finding um, polyps? Um, and, uh, you know, but really the, the main focus for the primary care doctor is to ensure that the exam was complete, that um, the findings are listed with the follow up and that the physician, the gastroenterologist was able to see the mucosa well, as indicated by the prep score. So, there are a couple questions in the chat about following up. Um, stool based testing. So, can you talk about what we should consider a timely colonoscopy for patients with positive stool test results and a little bit on um, what uh, if there's stuff you know about the rates of repeating stool based testing or rates of follow up abnormal stool based testing? I hope I'm getting all those questions right. So, I, I can take uh, that question. Uh, so, there are papers that were recently published that actually looked at um, the follow-ups after a positive fit. Uh, and it was shown that uh, the longer you go, obviously, the more risk there is uh, to find an advanced stage uh, cancer or advanced stage polyp. And so it was about six months. Anything delayed more than six months uh, after a positive fit has that increased risk. Uh, and so, ideally, we'd want to get patients in uh, between one to three months to have their diagnostic colonoscopy after their fit test. Uh, but honestly, no more than six months uh, obviously should be should be the goal uh, to to have them follow up uh, less than six months to to see what's going on. Uh, anything longer than that, obviously, um, we would definitely be worried that uh, we would be missing something that we could have caught earlier. Great. And just so, to, just to add to that, um, it's one of the things that uh, I've heard other physicians do in the primary care setting when they're offering these options is to be upfront with the patient and say, you know, we can do these non-invasive tests, but these are really two-step tests. If the first step is negative, then you can get away with only one step. But if the first step is positive then it's going to be necessary to complete that second part and to go with an invasive procedure. So, once the patients hear that, they, they start to wrap their mind around the fact that this could be, uh, this could end in a colonoscopy. And I think just to add, I completely agree to add furthermore is that patients understand that this is something that is like a program. It's not a one and done. So, even if you have that negative test, you don't have to go through that diagnostic colonoscopy. You still have to come back next year to do that test or every three years to do the multi-target stool DNA testing. So this is something that I think uh, you're spot on with Dr. Latore in terms of really explaining to patients that if you're following the stool-based program, then it's either annually or every three years, depending on that test. And obviously, if you're going through a colonoscopy program, then you're going to follow that based on what you find on, on those uh, examinations. And I think that's how I present it to patients. You know, some people, they feel like they're playing the lottery. They're like, look, if my Cologuard is normal or my FIT test is normal, I won the lottery. I don't have to have a colonoscopy. <laughs> um, not everybody feels that way. Other people feel like, oh, I can do one colonoscopy and be good for 10 years. Great. And maybe that feels like winning the lottery. And so I think, at least for me, it's sort of letting people kind of decide which of those camps they're in. Um, because you're right, some people feel like, oh, if I'm going to do the colonoscopy anyway, 
like let's get it over with and other people are like if you know if there's a good chance i won't need one let's skip it i think that goes to one of the questions here about patients who are resistant to colonoscopies how do you educate them i mean i guess my sort of first take on that is like you know i try to figure out why people are resistant i guess i try to figure out first does this person need a colonoscopy like if their average risk and a stool-based test would work and they're willing to do that even with the promise that they may need a colonoscopy at the end of the day you know i try to do that and then if I guess if people need a colonoscopy, I try to figure out, you know, which the part is that they're resistant to. I find most people are scared of the actual procedure when I think as Dr. Latorre said, everybody hates the cap way more than the procedure. Um, and sometimes that's enough to calm them down. I mean, do, do either of you have other advice for sort of uh, convincing people who are resistant to colonoscopies? I think it, it really comes down to getting to the core issue as you mentioned and really just asking questions um to the patient while you know reasoning with them like what is it that that really is frightening to them and actually one of the situations i found uh, myself in recently um with a patient that was resistant was and it was very difficult to elicit was a history of sexual abuse um, and it wasn't something that was very forthcoming, uh, that they were very forthcoming with, but that really was the, the whole limiting factor that after we peeled away all the layers was the concern. And so, you know, we talked about how we would approach this um, in a way that was mindful of that and, and where it wouldn't trigger um, a, a prior history or memories of, of abuse. So, but I mean, it really takes, a, a good conversation and, and breaking through the layers to see what the actual issue is. Is it the anesthesia? Is it like the fear of finding something? Is it, you know, some sort of PTSD? And I think along the same lines, uh, you'd have to, that's, that's super important because a lot of the times if we don't delve into why they're resistant to the colonoscopy, these may be patients who are either resistant to even getting the colonoscopy after their fit is positive or after their colagard is positive. And so at the end yeah. of the day, really finding out what that barrier is to that invasive test uh, to, uh, is, is key. Because again, you could choose the stool-based and that could delay things a little bit, but what if it's positive? This patient still has the same barrier that they had to colonoscopy, and now you're stuck with a positive test. So what do you do? Uh, so that's, that's definitely something to think about and, and spend time talking with your patient about uh, it could be fear or it could be logistical. It could be that, you know, they don't have any uh, way to to pay for these out-of-pocket costs because of insurance. And so that's obviously very nuanced and very individualized. But uh, the most important thing is to talk to your patient and find that out. Yeah. Great. So there's a question about um, an uninsured patient who needs a diagnostic colonoscopy and I guess needs to see a gastroenterologist first. That may be a more complicated question than we can answer right this moment. Maybe the person who asked that can DM us or something and we'll we'll see if we can connect and try to help them. Um, unless anybody on the panel has any advice about diagnostic colonoscopies for uninsured patients. Yeah. Nothing. All right. So I think sure. I mean um, to delve into to, that's a whole other topic, but also just to remember that the, you know, the county hospitals do have a um, sliding scale fee uh, system. So if it's really somebody that who, whose resources are limited, then, you know, that will be adjusted for their income. Yep. Good point. Hello. Um, somebody Hello. asked. I have, a, I have a, another comment about that. Uh, this is Dr. Ruth Skell from New York Presbyterian Queens. Uh, so the Hi. cancer service program from the New York State actually does a uh, fit test sent to the patients. But if the patients are positive in the fit test, they do yes. send for the colonoscopy. So the secret is to send them to have the fit test first with them, and then it will they will do the colonoscopy. They will pay for the colonoscopy. Yes. However, excellent if point. You send, if you send your patient a fit test and it's positive, then it's very hard to send them back to be scoped by this, the program. 
So the process has to start from the beginning. Right. That is, a, that is an excellent point. Thank you for raising that. Thank you. I did uh, just want to make one side point on that with the just the non-invasive tests in general. There is a high rate of false positives. Um, a lot of them are based on, on blood. So even the, um, the cold guard test, if there is any kind of blood in the exam, there, there is that fit portion, whether it's even from a hemorrhoid, that will mark as positive. And that can also be a really anxiety provoking experience for patients. So I, any, whenever you're um, discussing these options with patients, that's also something to discuss because then, you know, this exam is positive and then there's that slight, but, but true lag, you know, whether it's a week or, or two weeks to getting the colonoscopy or, or more, and that patient could be experiencing that anxiety of, do I have cancer in, in that period of time? So just something worth mentioning. That's a great point. And also there's potentially an insurance uh, challenge there too, right? Because I think if the, um, if the FIT test is positive, then the colonoscopy becomes a diagnostic colonoscopy. It's sort of the reverse of the CSP issue. And not every insurance covers, even though under the ACA, they have to cover screening colonoscopies. Um, they um, don't have to cover diagnostic colonoscopies. And so you can actually get into murky insurance issues if you have a positive fit test in that case. Um, okay, there was a question about a shortage of gold lightly. Do you know anything about that shortage? And is that, is gold lightly your favorite prep? It is not my favorite prep. Uh, <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to say that. <laughs> what not. is your favorite prep, Dr. It's, White? It's, it's vile. I mean, preps are terrible in general, but I feel that it has the most success for compliance when patients do use a, a, a split dose Miralax prep. And every gastroenterologist is going to tell you which prep is the, you know, their favorite. <laughs> I've had many <laughs> complaints of about Go Lightly. Um, I wasn't aware that there was a shortage. I've kind of moved away from giving go lightly and just um, prescribe and giving patients the choice of taking a split dose Miralax prep that they can mix with, you know, Gatorade or apple juice, whatever they would want to do it with. Great. All right. So it's 659, maybe some parting thoughts, you know, keeping the pandemic in mind um, and knowing that, you know, screening rates were low, that there's a backup for for getting people reconnected into endoscopy suites. Um, you know, I think my parting thought is always to remember to offer stool-based testing and colonoscopies and to start really young, but um, eager to hear your, your parting thoughts uh, before we conclude tonight. Dr. Latore, any key takeaways you wanna make sure people hear? You are on mute. Okay. Do you want to type in a parting thought, Dr. White? Uh, so, uh, parting thought would be uh, 45, 45, 45 patients uh, should know that the screening age has been lowered to 45. Uh, let them know that there are many modalities to getting screened. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, the one that they get done is obviously the most important one. So, they should, they should do it. Perfect. I'm back, but um, again, I definitely echo everything that Dr. White said. I, I do have to impart my bias as a gastroenterologist in saying that, um, you know, optical colonoscopy, so a true colonoscopy, um, really allows us to remove precancerous lesions. The other ones, the other tests are cancer detection tests. So they're positive when the patient, you know, presumably has cancer or is at risk. So Really, the colonoscopy is the preventative um, test that allows us to remove those precancerous lesions and to to really prevent the the cancer from developing. So, if you can discuss with your patient the benefits of a true colonoscopy and, and get them to agree to that, and it's appropriate, then I would suggest that. Um, even in light of COVID, but if not, then obviously the best test is the one that gets done. And just to remember, it's a two-step process thereafter. Great. 
All right, 701, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, there's the information for CME certificates um, and hope to see you all soon.